And now they're planning some trainee specific programming. And I think they're going to announce the schedule soon, but they have uh, a Twitter account, a Twitter handle, which is, if I'm not mistaken, Metab Trainees, I believe, at Metab Trainees. And um, they're going to, they have a survey there. And the survey specifically is trying to work out sort of what the, um, who everybody is in the, in the trainee community, what everyone's interested in, um, some different topics that might be of interest to different groups, and how to kind of roll out um, the trainee specific initiatives over the next few months. So please go on Twitter if you haven't already and fill out the survey. And then send the survey also by email to anybody that, anybody that, um, that you think is maybe perhaps not on Twitter. I know it's hard to imagine, but not everyone's on Twitter. I got an email yesterday asking um, something about the seminars and they can't find any information about it. And I realize it's because these people are not, not everyone's on Twitter. Um, so yeah, so feel free to email it around to your, your local trainees and everything else. So, um, so uh, today's speaker, um, Matthias Nierendorf comes to us uh, uh, from Massachusetts General Hospital where he's a professor um, and actually the uh, Richard Mo Moshner, Moshner Endowed Research Chair um, in Men's Health. And there, the talk today um, is probably going to involve quite a few monocytes, I imagine, and um, really cool uh, lifestyle and you know, other factors that control cardiovascular um, mechanisms and inflammation. Take it away, Matthias. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, please do feel free to um, interrupt with questions. I'm happy to have more of a discussion if, if you're interested in that and, and just, you know, having a monologue and, and, and speaking to my screen here. Um, um, thanks so much for having me. I think it's, it's a great initiative. It's, uh, um, it, it's a good idea to, you know, um, socialize and get together and hear about science um, while actually missing out on seeing each other uh, face to face. I hope that we can get back to that um, pretty soon. So um, the talk will uh, indeed deal with monocytes, but also uh, uh, tissue resident macrophages. Um, my lab works on uh, 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 predominantly the cardiovascular system and innate immune cells in it. And um, um, there's, there's really an expanding map of the type of immune cells that we find in the heart and in the, in the vasculature. Um, the, and, and also their functions. Um, so just uh, this week, uh, there was a, a really uh, interesting paper by Andres Hidalgo about cardiac macrophages um, actually taking over dysfunctional mitochondria from cardiomyocytes. Those uh, uh, function or those cells haven't made it on, on the slide here yet, but, but you can pretty much find them everywhere. And I think the, the, the the, the, the field got started by a paper uh, in PLOS ONE um, um, by uh, Alex Pinto and, and Nadja um, Rosenthal, who described that um, GFP positive macrophages were really numerous in the heart. And um, these, the, 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 the numbers have been confirmed in, in, uh, by other groups and also in humans. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, seven to eight percent of, of uh, non. Uh, myocytes uh, uh, um, um, being, being macrophages in the heart. And in addition to these resident macrophages, there's a whole other group of, of uh, macrophages that derives from the bone marrow. And so uh, my lab is working on the bone marrow quite a bit, which you know, for, for uh, run-of-the-mill cardiologists is still uncharted territory or maybe you know, an unnamed Canadian territory. Um, if you, if you, if you will, I think if you go and ask a cardiologist about the bone marrow, they will say things, you know, like about this, this, uh, this territory. You know, there's probably a lot of oil there. You know, they may have polar bears, maybe some penguins, um, or not. And and but I think it's changing. And uh, while I started out the same same way, uh, 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 we've learned quite a bit, and the whole journey was motivated by the insight that a lot of the disease promoting monocytes and macrophages are made in, in, the, in the bone marrow. We can find them in plaques and we can find them in the myocardium. Normally the myocardium relies on local proliferation, but if there is acute or chronic disease, you can see that uh, it starts to recruit uh, uh, monocytes made in, in the bone marrow. And so, 
um, our lab really started to be interested in production of these cells because their half uh, life is pretty short. So in an acute infarct, the, 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 the half life of a macrophage is about 20 hours. So there's constant turnover. Um, uh, uh, there's a just in time production and um, the heart uh, recruits these cells um, very rapidly and in, at a high uh, uh, frequency. The same is true for uh, chronic uh, uh, inflammation, maybe not as high as a clip here. So there are estimates um, um, by, by Clint Robbins and, and Phil that uh, there the turnover in, in mature atherosclerotic plaques uh, is in mice is about uh, a month or so. But if you look at data on, on human monocyte uh, blood half-life, it's also uh, on the order of a day. So we're looking at cells that uh, are really produced just in time by hematopoietic stem cells. And um, just for, for people that aren't as familiar with these cells, I, I put in this slide. Um, I find these cells really interesting. They're fairly rare. Um, it's, it's commonly estimated that mice and humans have about 10,000 long-term hematopoietic stem cells. There are now some more recent estimates that say uh, perhaps there are more of these. Um, um, but um, the numbers are low, um, but they give rise to a billion blood cells every day. And um, um, you, you can see that there are different uh, stages um, and, and branches in the hematopoietic tree here. And while we're going from uh, uh, left to right on this slide, you see that the cells differentiate more um, all the way to monocytes, which are then released. Uh, during that process, they pick up proliferation. On the left-hand side, only three to five percent of these long-term HSCs proliferate, whereas our immediate progenitors can go up to fifty percent of them or so. And then the lifespan also gets gets uh, uh, shorter. While uh, long-term hematopoietic stem cells really live uh, 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 quite a long time, they can even survive uh, the mouth. Um, and um, uh, live on uh, after transplantation. Um, that's not true for the immediate uh, uh, progenitors, which will uh, exhaust because they have a limited cell renewal uh, uh, capacity. So we've, we've, we've started to think about the signals and networks that regulate production of, uh, of uh, uh, cells and, and other labs have too. And it, it's becoming clear that production of innate immune cells, which then uh, travel to cardiovascular organs to, to promote disease depends on, on a number of factors and uh, uh, it's actually uh, uh, ramped up in the setting of cardiovascular disease. So our hematopoietic stem cells proliferate harder and they do so because they rely on signals that we only partially understand. The, the field of hematology has worked on the uh, hematopoietic niche for a while and so we know that there are certain cells involved that really build a house and the environment for hematopoietic stem cells. Those include endothelial cells, stromal cells, some macrophages, and so forth. And there's a number of known uh, factors that influence hematopoietic cell behavior. And um, uh, uh, chiefly among them, uh, stem cell factor or um, also CXCL12. They retain uh, uh, stem cells, they uh, keep them quiescent, they, uh, they are growth factors that will increase uh, 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 proliferation. And there is a dozen or so of these factors known and, and people are still trying to understand um, what differential importance they have in the steady state and what cells they really derive from. Uh, but it's already clear that these factors and that niche that uh, house for the stem cells changes quite drastically in the setting of cardiovascular disease and in the setting um, of, of uh, pre-cardiovascular conditions such as diabetes or obesity. This all may affect the production of uh, disease-promoting uh, um, cells. So um, what we're trying to do is really understand uh, how cardiovascular disease affects this, this, this situation. And so on this slide, you see uh, uh, Phil, who's a good friend and long-time collaborator and myself, thinking about how to approach this, this problem. Um, this is us in the Kinsale. This is a local Irish uh, bar. And, and so uh, in one of these discussions, we came up with 
with the uh, insight that we, you know, maybe what we need to do is observe nature in order to learn uh, more about what's actually happening. And so um, um, the, 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 the goal here is to, to think about uh, conditions that lead or protect against a cardiovascular disease. And perhaps that can then help us to, to uncover pathways that, that, uh, that we don't know about and ultimately drug them. And so, so this kind of idea has been uh, uh, quite good. I think you know, it happened during the first or the second pine. That's why it survived. And, and so we've been working uh, on, on this type of, of, of uh, topic for a while now. And we focus on lifestyle factors because they are known to be really important risk factors for cardiovascular disease that um, just like hyperlipidemia or hypertension have uh, powerful odds ratios. And um, those, those four here um, are shown and um, we know that they affect uh, cardiovascular disease. And the goal here is to really use them to tease out their role in in leukocyte production and how they fuel inflammation uh, by supplying uh, inflammatory cells. Um, so I, I briefly saw that Cameron is, is, is on the call. Uh, I wanted to highlight uh, with one slide his work um, that, that came out uh, recently on sleep interruption. Um, so this is a risk factor that increases uh, a, a production of um, inflammatory monocytes uh, via hypocretin and uh, the growth factor CSF1. So have a look at, at that paper if you're interested in, in sleep. Um, uh, quite a bit back now, we, we looked at cardiovascular risk as a, as a function of stress. Stress is a very powerful um, uh, uh, risk factor. Um, there are clinical st uh, 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 studies saying that the odds ratio of cardiovascular disease increases by uh, 2.4 um, if you're exposed to stress at home or at work. And so the, the, the question here was, does it impact the bone marrow? We exposed uh, mice to um, random stressors that, that are currently uh, used in, 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 in psychology and psychiatry research. And we found that this does affect the bone marrow quite a bit. Um, we get higher noradrenaline levels in the, in the bone marrow. Uh, the, the, uh, we can uh, detect more tyrosine hydroxylase, which is the rate limiting enzyme for noradrenaline synthesis. You can actually see here tyrosine hydroxylase staining uh, in sympathetic nerve fibers that uh, uh, are um, found uh, along arterioles in the bone marrow. As a function of stress, CXCL12 quiescence and retention factor drops in the bone marrow, and we find more. HSCs and higher uh, incorporation of BRDU into, into HSCs um, if these mice are exposed to psychosocial stress. Um, as a function of, of that downstream, we find more inflammatory um, activity in, in atherosclerotic plaques. So this is a fluorescence molecular tomography of proteases, which are involved in uh, matrix uh, degradation and, and plaque destabilization you find more of these in APOE knockout mice which uh, were stressed. This area of interest here is the aortic root, which is um, our favorite go-to imaging area, um, where we also uh, look for um, plaques by histology. This is a good imaging target because it's surrounded by air and photons uh, travel well uh, through air. If you do flow cytometry on these on these uh, aortas uh, expanded from stressed mice, you will find more neutrophils and more monocyte and macrophages in the stressed cohort. And we, we did a small clinical pilot in, in uh, physicians um, to see whether uh, we can find similar uh, um, conditions in, in physicians that are exposed to stress because they work on intensive care unit and you can ask them their standardized uh, uh, questionnaires um, uh, that will give you the stress level. Um, they are more stressed when they go to work. I think, you know, in, in times of pandemic, depending on where you work, um, you're probably also stressed when you're at home. Nevertheless, uh, back then, um, that wasn't the case. Um, and then, so while they're working, they're, they're uh, 
their uh, shifts, um, we found higher leukocyte levels in, in the blood of these uh, uh, ICU residents. And there's ongoing work um, on the clinical translation of these findings. Um, so here is a, a, a paper cited by uh, Ahmed Tavako and the Haifayats groups um, where uh, FDG PET imaging in, in patients was used to look at the same time into metabolic activity of the amygdala, which is a fear center, uh, FDG uptake into atherosclerotic blood and also the bone marrow. And so this paper uh, recorded um, a correlation between these three sites. And uh, Zai is now running a prospective trial uh, looking into uh, uh, these into these uh, pathways in, in humans further. And um, there, there's also more preclinical work trying to better tease out um, how stress works and what other pathways um, are involved in activating uh, production and also uh, activating phenotypes of immune cells that then lead to damage in the heart or in um, the arterial wall. Um, they, the, the, the more positive lifestyle, depending on your uh, lifestyle factor, depending on your um, uh, uh, view, is physical activity. Um, um, and, and so we, we discussed quite a bit how to best um, get at this. There are different models of, of exercise in, in, in mice. And um, there are actually quite a bit of published data. And when we got going, uh, the, the question was really, and this exercise affect hematopoiesis? Does it affect leukocytes? There were pre-existing data saying that depending on the exercise level, you actually have more leukocytes. So these are studies in people that just ran a marathon. Um, they actually have high monocyte and neutrophil levels. And then um, we also found some pretty good uh, uh, preclinical mouse studies saying that, you know, if you put mice on a treadmill, and uh, uh, this is the typical setup where they get a little electric shock to motivate them to run, um, it leads to more hematopoiesis. And so we thought, okay, maybe this is a confounding uh, psychosocial stress in, inferred by anxiety and, um, or these electric shocks, um, because we do know that physical activity or lack of physical activity is an important risk factor. So. What we did is we uh, chose to use voluntary running instead, uh, arguing that perhaps here the mice are not as stressed. And one downside of this uh, uh, is that um, you can actually, not, you can't house more than one mouse in, in the cage, which, which is stressful to the mice uh, by itself. So, and it increases also uh, the, the rent in your mouse colony. Uh, but the upside is you can actually measure how much the uh, mice run, and they run a lot. They run uh, more than 10 kilometers a night, and they do this consistently. They really love doing it. There's a bit of a warm-up phase during the first week, but then you will see that they, they keep running. And uh, if you then look at blood glucoside levels as a function of, of, of uh, uh, this, you will see that during the active phase, uh, exercise reduces glucoside levels including uh, the leukocytes that we're most interested in, in atherosclerosis, so neutrophils and, and monocytes, um, but all other classes are, are pretty much affected. Um, we didn't see any difference in platelets and red blood cells, so they were uh, exempted here. Um, I wonder whether um, this may be related to you know, just the, the, the effects of endurance exercise uh, we know that in, in, in people that do this a lot, you actually get more red blood cells, a higher HP, just because oxygen consumption goes up. That's a training effect. So maybe that counteracts what we see in terms of uh, white blood cells here. So going upstream, we uh, uh, assayed uh, hematopoietic uh, progenitor cells and found quite a bit of difference in proliferation on the LSK level. So um, this is shown the gating here. We're looking at secret positive scum and positive cells in sedentary and exercising mice. And then BRDU incorporation. And we see that um, this BRDU incorporation, which, which re reports on proliferation, is reduced in, in mice that have access to treadmills. Uh, this is plotted down here. And um, we also find a lower colony forming units uh, in, in these exercising mice. 
Um, one question uh, that we asked ourselves was how long do these effects last? I, you know, how long can you pause going to the gym before you um, get penalized for being a slacker? And so what we did here is we had a, a cohort that was uh, exercising for six weeks, but then stopped exercising for three weeks. And while the leukocyte levels were um, still significantly lower at, uh, than in the, in the sedentary, we could tell that uh, uh, things are returning already to the sedentary level. So we, we don't know how fast this happens in, in, in humans, but uh, um, the, the, the take home here, it's not recommended to uh, uh, have long breaks of exercise. And the question was, do these, are these effects actually um, intrinsic to progenitor cells? And the typical uh, essay that we do here is we transplant these. The, the, the beautiful thing about blood stem cells is that you can easily put them into an irradiated recipient. They will uh, expand in, in, this, in this host in, in which you have removed uh, uh, um, hematopoietic stem cells by irradiation and then give rise to blood cells. And we did this in a one-to-one -one competitive fashion, isolating uh, the same number of LSKs from sedentary or exercising mice. And then what we found is that uh, in, in, in if you have uh, uh, sedentary marrow competing to sedentary with sedentary marrow, there's uh, equal chimerism. But if you do this with a, a marrow from a running mouse, you can see that the, the, the stem cells that come from a sedentary mouse win out against the sedentary, uh, against the running cells. So the blood chimerism is in favor of the sedentary mouse. And if you look at the, at the bone marrow, you can see that um, the chimerism of Ellis case is similar, which indicates that initially the cells were engrafting to the, to the same degree and they're still around. But um, LSKs from exercising uh, uh, mice were proliferating uh, much harder, despite the fact that they're uh, uh, from sedentary mice. Sorry, despite the fact that they are now in the in the same environment. Interestingly, the chimerism of of long term HSC. So these are now LSKs where you, in addition, uh, gate for uh, 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 SLAM markers seem to trend in the opposite direction, and you could you could. Uh, hypothesize that perhaps exercise protects those cells. Um, so so why, why do these effects travel with uh, stem cells? Um, why is there uh, a such memory for physical activity? And to get at that point, we did an experiment where we uh, looked at um, the epigenetics associated with physical activity, um, doing uh, atex -seq on LSKs that are uh, uh, har harvested from these three cohorts here. And what you can see is that, that there's actually quite a bit of change. We didn't really find high amplitude changes, but in general, in the sedentary mice, chromatin accessibility was increased and that included uh, 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 genes that are involved in the cell cycle. We don't really know for sure uh, what causes these epigenetic changes, one, one hypothesis is that just by the virtue of these cells being more active and cycling more, it will actually lead to changes in their uh, chromatin structure that allows for this um, uh, uh, phenotype of more proliferation and that uh, then persists. So these, these chromatin changes persist and then they will uh, uh, perpetuate um, uh, the, 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 the phenotype. So how does it come about? How is it relayed um, um, in terms of uh, hematopoietic niche factors? What we uh, did is we essayed the go-to run-of-the-mill uh, uh, factors and uh, found quite a bit of change. And we can see that in exercising mice, there's more CXCO12, um, which uh, keeps, retains uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells in quiescence and in the bone marrow. There's more VCAM1, uh, more uh, SCF uh, and more angiopoietin uh, one. We also assayed CXCL12 on protein level and found that those are higher in the bones of uh, running mice. 
uh, we then ask the question, which specific niche cells are uh, um, responsible for, for this, this phenotype? And um, so these niche cells um, are, are an interesting ensemble of different cells. It's actually quite expanding. Um, um, probably, you know, as we uh, look at these data, there are, there are more clusters of, of niche cells that are now typically looked at uh, with single cell resolution. Um, we went through the typical um, reporter mice and, 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 and niche cells um, that um, were available um, at this, this, this time. And the one that st stands out here, I'm not showing you all the neutral data, which are in, in the paper for all the other niche cells, were stromal cells that are identified by expressing the, the leptin receptor. So you can sort them uh, um, using a reporter mouse based on YFP expression and then run PCR for these retention factors that we just looked at. And we found that uh, in these leptin receptor positive stromal cells, um, which are also called MSCs or mesenchymal stromal cells, uh, we found a difference here. And um, this leptin receptor is uh, used as a label to identify these cells, but it's also a very important uh, 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 receptor for leptin. And so um, um, Vanessa made the connection here and said, let's look at leptin. There had been prior reports on leptin being changed uh, as a function of exercise, and that makes sense. It's a it's a very important uh, uh, hormone that's that's made by um, the adipose tissue. It regulates uh, uh, hunger um, among other things. And what we what we found is that leptin expression in the adipose tissue is reduced in running mice, and we can find lower leptin levels uh, in the blood and also in 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 the in the bone marrow of, of running mice. So, so what, we, what we think happens here is that uh, leptin that's, that comes from outside the bone binds to the leptin receptor and um, to, in order to really get a causality here, we deleted the leptin receptor in these stromal cells using Pyrex-1 uh, Cree that's inducible by tamoxifen, um, basically deleting uh, the leptin receptor. So these cells can now not sense leptin anymore. Um, this mimics exercise, so to, so, so to speak, because exercise reduces uh, signaling of leptin to these cells. And what we find is that this reduction of, of, of a leptin uh, receptor in, in hematopoietic niche cells mimics the, the exercise effects. We find less leukocytes in circulation, uh, and the niche factors are regulated um, as discussed uh, for exercise. So what, what, we, what we think is happening here is that sedentary mice produce more leptin, uh, which acts on the niche cells. These niche cells then change the, the microenvironment for, for hematopoietic stem cells, which get more active and provide more leukocytes that then uh, promote cardiovascular disease. If you start uh, um, mice on exercise um, that have developed flux already, so this looks like a regression phenotype, you can actually see that exercise has good effects. It reduces leptins, uh, leptin in the blood and the bone marrow. And then as an uh, effect of that, it, uh, it also stops this, this increase of leukocytes that, that we typically see in APOE knockout mice on a high fat diet and it reduces inflammation and flux and also flux size. The question then is, do we see the same effects in, in people? And so we uh, looked at two uh, pre-existing cohorts here, the Cantos cohort and then um, AthroExpress uh, Biobank. And what we found is that um, there are similar relationships as reported in the mice. So in, in these cohorts, um, the, the participants reported their physical activity in questionnaires and um, leptin levels were either available in, in Cantos or could be measured in, in banked specimens. And you, you can actually see that uh, there is a very similar uh, relationship. The more people exercise, the lower the leptin and the lower the leukocyte levels. So uh, what we're doing now is to, to really um, drill deeper into the interconnection
between different uh, factors. They all uh, um, affect each other, that's for sure. And um, this pathway just described for Lex leptin is probably one of, of many, perhaps not even the most important. Um, what, what is uh, uh, pretty clear to me is that this uh, uh, intervention may serve as a biomimetic uh, drug discovery platform where we can look for uh, uh, pathways that we can inhibit without a penalty. Um, we've seen in these mice that the immune defense against sepsis is not compromised. So uh, perhaps this is a chance to really target pathways um, without uh, inflicting collateral damage. So this is an, a very active area of work uh, where we continue to, to study uh, stress and physical activity and also sleep. Um, I don't know if there are questions to that. Do you want to do this now or do you want me to go into uh, uh, the second uh, part of, of it's up to you. Um, does anyone want to have questions uh, at this point, or do we want to wait until the end? Let's see what kind of action we, we usually wait till the end. So maybe we'll just keep going, and then okay, we can... sounds good. Okay. So I I I, I brought a second uh, uh, a vignette um, for today where we're not focusing so much on bone marrow derived cells, but rather on, on resident macrophages, which live in all tissues, not just cardiovascular tissues, and uh, are really uh, an integral point of pathways that are active in, in disease and in, in, in the steady state. So we're, we're learning about functions of, 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 of resident immune cells that don't even have to do with immunity. And um, the, the question really in this project was, how are these cells affected in, in systemic injuries? So, so what we did here is we looked at resident uh, uh, macrophage populations in all major organ systems as a function of uh, ischemic injury, so stroke, MI, on, and also uh, sequel ligation and puncture, which leads to sepsis. And we didn't look at the uh, site of injury or the site of infection, but rather we looked at the ripple effects that occur in resident immune cells everywhere else in the body. And uh, the hypothesis was that um, in a remote or systemic injury will affect these immune cells. And um, this may have consequences for resilience against secondary injuries um, uh, akin to uh, trained immunity, or it could also affect the, the, the non-canonical functions of, of resident macrophages um, that, that we know about. So um, the seat map here shows you what happens in terms of resident cell numbers. Um, red is more numbers than normal. Blue is uh, you have less numbers. And you can see that this is quite an active um, um, phenomenon that you do see, uh, for instance, um, after MI, an increase in liver macrophages. Or after CLP, you, you see uh, a, a, a decrease in, in resident liver macrophages and so forth. And we found this, these fluctuations uh, uh, pretty much across all organs, the weakest uh, organ being uh, uh, that the weakest change uh, are happening in the brain, uh, which is probably due to microglia living behind the blood-brain barrier, which filters out some of the um, 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 signals that occur when, when, a, when an emote injury is inflicted. So um, we then uh, flow sorted uh, resident macrophages from all these different organs here and did um, uh, 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 expression analysis. And um, here we're looking at the number of uh, regulated sing single genes. And you can see that there's uh, quite a bit of, of uh, difference depending on, on the injury and organ um, that we're looking at with the highest number of single regulated genes in the liver after CLP. And again, a fairly low numbers um, changed in, uh, in, in, the, in the brain. And um, if, if, you, if you look at these changes, um, it's interesting uh, that they're really 
um, deep, that they really depend on the tissue that the macrophage uh, lives in. So uh, this is a principal component analysis where uh, any differences in gene expression are uh, uh, fed into the location here in the sp space. And you see that the macrophages really cluster neatly together depending on where they live. This has been known for some time now for the steady state, but we found that uh, this effect beats any remote injury. So uh, for instance, here these heart macrophages um, um, uh, contain also heart macrophages after injury. They still cluster all together with heart macrophages. You could have hypothesized that any injury now will make them cluster somewhere completely different because now they're M1 macrophages, but that's not the case. Um, they're still pretty similar to, uh, to heart macrophages. So this is a, a heat map that illustrates some of the expression uh, changes. And so, so uh, one interesting observation was it really mattered most for these full changes in genes, uh, um, which, which organ you're looking at. It's not so important uh, when injury occurred. So just to explain this heat map a little bit uh, on top here, you see um, the different organs. So for instance, here, this is um, all in the lung. And then and down here, you see the first three uh, biological replicates are lung macrophages after stroke. And then these three here are lung macrophages after myocardial infarction. And then the, the last three are lung macrophages after sepsis. And um, you see that you know, there are certain clusters where no matter what injury you're looking at, um, genes go up and certain go down. And um, that's actually true for most organs. And then in addition to it, there's also a shared cluster up. So here, I think uh, what we're looking at are genes that uh, are the typical macrophage inflammatory responses. So part of it, these are acute phase uh, uh, proteins and, and inflammatory um, cytokines that no matter where the macrophages live and no matter what injury is inflicted, are the typical macrophage response genes. So let's look uh, a little bit at the lung, um, um, what happens here in terms of numbers. Um, you can actually by flow cytometry discern alveolar macrophages from interstitial macrophages, which are very rare in the steady state, but are uh, recruited in, 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 in pathologies. And so what, what we found after MI is that the number of alveolar macrophages actually increases. And that happens not due to uh, uh, recruitment, uh, but proliferation, some, some fake mapping there. And, um, but recruitment happens also. Interstitial macrophages go up a little bit later. You can see this actually by uh, histology as well. So then we said, is this physiologically relevant? Does anything change uh, uh, how these alveolar macrophages can actually, or lung macrophages, respond to a secondary injury? And so what we did here is we chose a clinically relevant secondary uh, 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 injury. We instilled uh, strep pneumonia into the trachea of these mice. Um, and that's relevant because patients that have uh, acute myocardial infarction may have as a complication pneumonia that happens in, especially in people that are hospital, hospitalized longer and have, have large infarcts and perhaps heart failure. And so the, the, the idea or the hypothesis is that you know, if there's a second hit to the system, they probably will do worse because we thought, okay, if a patient has pneumonia on top of a myocardial infarction, that, that's a bad thing. And so interestingly, the, the, the exact opposite happened. And um, we have a neat readout here because we use bioluminescent bacteria. So we can image these, these, these animals every day and our bioluminescence signal, um, for instance here in this control mouse, shows you how many bacteria live in the lung of this mouse. So this is the same mouse over time. You see that um, it's actually the, the bacteria uh, are growing and multiplying, you get more over time. And so that's actually really attenuated in our infarct group. This was something that um, Felix couldn't really believe. You, you see that there is a lot of mice here in, in both groups. Each dot is a mouse. 
And um, just to point this out, this is logarithmic scale, so this is not a small effect. So mice that had a prior MI really uh, got rid of their bacteria much better. And that was specific for MI. So if you induce stroke or sequel ligation and puncture, i.e. sepsis, this protection wasn't really there. It's something that is specific to myocardial infarction. So then the question is, is it triggered by recruited cells or by alveolar macrophages, which are locally derived? We did the whole experiment in CCR2 knockout mice, which can't recruit uh, 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 monocytes to the lung after MI. And so the, the protection um, that we that we observed uh, uh, went away. So um, no, let me re uh, 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 retract that. Uh, the protection was was still there. So um, it's plotted down here. You see CCR2 knockout mice that that uh, don't recruit monocytes to the lung behave exactly the after wild, uh, like wild type after mice. They're still protected. So it's not due to um, due to recruitment. And uh, in a second step, we then depleted local macrophages by instilling clodronate into the trachea. And uh, that gets rid of your alveolar macrophages. And this now uh, uh, made the protection go away. So now exterior, uh, bacteria could expand after myocardial infarction. And um, you can actually see that clodronate uh, depletion of alveolar macrophages um, uh, neutralized the survival benefit that, uh, that was uh, conferred by myocardial infarction. So the question is what happens here? What do these alveolar macrophages do? We went to our expression profiling and saw that uh, phagocytic pathways were enriched in, in, in the alveolar macrophages that were retrieved after myocardial infarction, and that was specific to myocardial infarction. We didn't observe this after COP. So um, the hypothesis um, that we tested then was that the alveolar macrophages are more capable of ingesting bacteria, and that's the case. So here's a flow cytometry experiment where we look at um, phagocytosis of fluorescent uh, um, E. coli particles and um, that's indeed, uh, uh, they're indeed more incorporated into alveolar, alveolar macrophages if these mice experience myocardial infarction. So then the, the, the question is, how does this uh, increased resilience uh, come about? And um, we, we wondered whether um, it is a circulating factor that alerts and primes alveolar macrophages. We started out with parabiosis where you uh, stitch mice together um, and you, know, you can see that um, our bioluminescence imager just allows to, to image both parabions together. These are the, the nose cones that provide isofluorine anesthesia. And then um, we have uh, one infected mouse, the other mouse is not infected. Um, this is our parabion that either didn't get MI or gets MI. And what you see here is uh, if this guy here gets a MI, there are less bacteria in the parabiome. So this really means that there is likely uh, a circulating factor in the blood that uh, uh, reaches alveolar macrophages and then uh, protects these mice. And in looking for, for a, a, a candidate, we um, again consulted the expression profiling and found that um, the hallmark gene set for interferon gamma response was enriched in alveolar macrophages after myocardial infarction. And so that really uh, was a good candidate because interferon gamma is known to uh, uh, prime macrophages. And uh, we found an increased amount of in interferon gamma in the lung after myocardial infarction. And then if we injected uh, um, recombinant interferon gamma, um, we uh, observe uh, protective uh, phenotypes. So this is interferon gamma that is instilled into the lung um, and uh, it reduces the amount of bacteria that we detect by bioluminescence imaging. To get at this uh, uh, mechanistically, uh, we deleted the interferon gamma receptor from alveolar macrophages using uh, CD11C3 and indeed, we found that then protection goes away, um, which is shown over here. 
So then the remaining question is, uh, where does the interferon gamma come from? Um, we found it's actually uh, that uh, it's actually not lymphocytes, but um, uh, NK cells. Um, here's a single cell uh, RNA-seq um, RNA data set illustrating that in NK cell, we find an increased uh, expression of interferon gamma um, uh, in the heart. Um, just a few words uh, about a phenotype that I also found really surprising and interesting and relevant uh, for anybody interested in heart macrophages. If you induce sequel ligation and puncture sepsis in mice, there's really quite a bit that goes on in, in heart macrophages. There's a surprising drop, about half of the macrophages disappear 24 hours after onset of sepsis. And then there is a, a, is a long lasting increase of, of macrophages in the heart. And um, so we, we thought, why are they uh, diminished? Are they dying? And that's indeed the case. So you can see that uh, PI incorporation into heart macrophages goes up after uh, uh, sepsis. And that's probably due to the fact that these bacteria that are circulating in the blood are taken up, taken up by heart macrophages. Um, and that leads to the demise of the cells. And then uh, these cells recover due to local proliferation. So we, we go, uh, we see more uh, 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 um, cardiac macrophages in, in the active uh, cell cycle phases. Um, but there's also recruitment um, after, after uh, sepsis. So um, this, this, uh, bo both processes uh, contribute to the recovery and then actually an overshoot of numbers after myocardial infarction um, that wasn't observed um, uh, in the brain. So um, then the question is, what, what do these, these macrophages do? And what is this uh, change phenotype good for? Um, when we looked at expression data that were collected four days after inducing sepsis, one of the top hits was actually IL-10, which is anti-inflammatory. So we deleted IL-10 from macrophages and then induced sepsis and looked for myocyte injury. And so what you can find is that in the blood, uh, the death marker for, for cardiomyocytes, cardiac troponin goes up. So it, it leaks out of cardiomyocytes that are dying um, if macrophages um, don't make IL-10. And your tunnel positive cardiomyocytes also increases if, if macrophages don't make IL-10. So the, 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 the local cardiac macrophages suppress inflammation and uh, protect cardiomyocytes uh, via this anti-inflammatory um, uh, interleukin. So taken together, um, what happens here after any injury is that our macrophages, no matter what tissue they live in, sense this injury. If it's hard, uh, if it's if it's um, a, a large enough in, uh, injury, this changes the number of cells, um, mostly by local proliferation, to some degree, also by recruitment. And it changes the, the, the transcription and the phenotype in these, in these macrophages. So that means, you know, for instance, you undergo some sort of um, flu. Uh, it will affect uh, your uh, uh, tissue reserve macrophages in pretty much all organs. And it may influence uh, how these organs then react to secondary challenges. Overall, uh, uh, tissue reserve macrophages promote resilience um, and uh, their prime, we've seen that the net effect is a good one. Uh, so they, they became more active and basically ready for a secondary challenge. But uh, there is a cost to it. They also were more inflammatory and inflicted more inflammatory collateral damage to that organ at the same time. So, um, yeah, I think you know this is this is this is interesting because it illustrates that cardiac macrophages um, may actually um, be altered for quite a while after any infection, and that may have consequences for the resilience or vulnerability of the heart uh, for for uh, secondary challenges. So with this, I I want to. Uh, 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 conclude. I uh, want to thank uh, the people that were involved in, in uh, especially um, resilient 
um, because these were uh, pretty large projects that went through a laborious revision uh, 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 process. I want to point out uh, uh, Vanessa, who's the, who's the lead author on the exercise uh, manuscript, and, um, and Felix, who is the lead author on, on the immunity manuscript. He uh, was particularly resilient. He, uh, this manuscript had been uh, submitted to a different journal, uh, specifically to Nature Medicine, which invited a revision, which he worked on for one year, which was then rejected. And um, yeah, he did then a second revision for immunity. So it's just a lesson um, how hard this, this can be, this game. And um, I, I thought that was, um, you know, not a good experience um, to, to really close the door after inviting a revision. I, I want to ask everybody not to do this as a reviewer. I, I, not, I don't do this, but it was great how Felix uh, stood up to that pressure and didn't lose his nerve, but uh, soldiered on and um, found a good home for this, this work. And yeah, that's it from my side. And I hope you guys have questions for me. That's great. Thank you, Matthias. And thank you for sharing that story. I think it certainly tells you that the end, you know, the journal that where a story ends up doesn't reflect its value or its, you know, importance or its impact and, you know, and highlighting the resilience of your trainees is awesome too. Um, okay, so Ad, I see you have your hand up, but I'm going to get to go first because uh, I'm and and Zahi. Okay, Zahi literally put his hand up. He didn't. He didn't. He doesn't use Zoom. He's like Zoom is Zoom is you know so high tech. Um, so first, I'm going to ask about presumably, of course, I'm sure you I get asked this all the time about COVID and macrophages in the in the heart and and what the interactions might be. Um, so has anyone? What are the? What do we know at this point in terms of the? potential interactions and the you know differences between potentially a bacterial pneumonia that you've been studying and something viral like this yeah I, I think that that the jury's still out I think that the data are coming in um, as we speak and um, there there's quite a bit of data on you know the frequency of cardiac injury in this in, in this condition and I think you know no matter uh, where you look there are, there are pathways that may be involved I think you know there could be secondary injury where you know you have the infection in the lung ARDS. It most likely leads to changes to in in heart macrophages, and then there there's also quite some evidence that there is direct injury. You know perhaps there's viremia, um, uh, endothelial cells are certainly affected. So so I think um, I don't have an answer here. I I think it's it's probably a mix. Um, mm -hmm. um, but uh, what's pretty clear is that the heart is affected and there are autopsy studies showing that heart macrophages increase in, in patients that have uh, this infection, especially um, if there are cardiac complications, you know, inflammation in the heart goes up. Yeah, okay. Right, we don't have the answers yet, of course, but I'm sure, I'm sure we'll figure it out soon. Okay, so Ada, go ahead and then, and then we can go for more questions after that, Zahi after that. Yeah, I mean, uh, first, thanks for the depressing story. <laughs> uh, if if any of the of the trainees want to, to get more resilient, maybe we can do it with the, in the trainee sessions. Uh, but my question was that regarding the leptin receptor uh, and the leptin producing cells. So the leptin receptor cells, you said those are MSCs. They are also the adipocyte progenitors. Um, so I was wondering if you um, looked at the interaction between those cells and whether the leptin producing cells are uh, in the bone marrow, are they in the fat, which fat depot is it, uh, etc. Yeah, so we looked at uh, a, a leptin uh, uh, production by PCI and it looked like it doesn't come from the bone marrow. And um, uh, what, we, what we found is that on, uh, uh, on you know, expression level PCR, and we found it uh, uh, going up in visceral adipose tissue. And um, we found that the, the, the protein levels of leptin increase in the blood and the bone marrow to the same extent. And we interpreted that as um, you know, leptin really coming from an extra bone 
sauce and being yeah, brought in with the bread. Okay, Sahib, go ahead. Matthias, wonderful talk. Um, just wanted to ask you a little bit on, on uh, have you thought a little bit about the aspect of volume and intensity of physical activity? You know, it's been always reported and recently even in the UK Biobank over 95,000 people, you know, shown that uh, this would re lead to a reduction uh, in mortality. But as you know very well, since you're an avid uh, ex ex practice of exercise, there are different ways to exercise. And I wonder if you have thought of some neat experiments to try to tease out uh, the different exercise regimens and what they do uh, to, uh, to the cells. Yeah, um, I have not. Um, I, I think that, that that's probably something you, you want to do in humans. It's hard to model, you know, different exercise types in, in, in mice. Mm -hmm. I think some people have tried that, you know, weightlifting in mice. <laughs> yeah. But I, I don't really know how well that translates. Yeah. So I, I think this is an excellent point. I think the jury's still out in terms of how much exercise is necessary. The current guidelines recommend 150 uh, minutes per week. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, yeah, I don't think it is that the relation is the the more the better. I, I think you know there will be a threshold where it will be harmful. Yeah. If you run a marathon every day, it will kill you eventually. Yeah, and, you, you, and need, so, you need some recovery. Yeah. Yeah. So you know there's probably a sweet spot, um, and and I don't think we know where it is. I also like to prove uh, the other side that, uh, you know, seven minute exercise is also not sufficient. So, <laughs> yeah, you could do that. You know, you could uh, stop the treadmill in the case. That's pretty straightforward. That's a, that's a good idea. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? And raising, actually, I do have one more question and this is probably because I don't remember some of the initial data. So I apologize to, Phil and Clint and others, whether or not intervention with statins de decreases sort of monocyte counts and bone marrow activation and the things that we know hyperlipidemia does. Because I noticed you sort of, you know, as you were talking about the lifestyle, you you know, you mentioned yeah. how these are a lot of them are intervention. You can you right. can intervene, and it's yeah. sort of. But I can't remember if that was ever done or if you guys have ever done that. So I can tell you, we, we haven't done it. I also don't think, I'm not aware that somebody carefully looked at hematopoietic stem cell activity as a function of statin therapy. But, you know, I would predict there's a good cor correlation, you know, based on the work by, for instance, Alan Tall. Yeah. And Andrew Murphy, uh, uh, showing that really it's uh, hyperlipidemia that, that uh, uh, can contribute to increased progenitor uh, uh, a proliferation. They showed it on the on the on the level of LSKs pretty nicely. So I think that it's not unlikely that the known anti-inflammatory effects of statins um, may rely on lowering the lipid level. Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, uh, after all, you know, maybe some 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 part of the benefits that we get with these drugs is due to their effect on. On, on hematopoiesis secondary to lowering the black cholesterol. Oh, Esther, yeah, go ahead. Muted, so. Um, Matthias, beautiful talk. I have one question and it's about the last part. Do you know what is the driving factor that actually communicates to all of these different tissue macrophages to um, to report that there's an injury? Is that like um, adrenaline or some cortisol? Or uh, is that like a more generalized mechanism? Or do you have any clue? No, I don't. Um, uh, I think that those are all good candidates, though. I think, you yeah. know, it's, uh, uh, it's known that, that leukocytes in general express receptors for the signals that you just mentioned. So yeah. um, in addition, it could be... Uh, 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 dangerous signals, you know, circulating toll-like toll receptor ligands that may activate uh, tissue resident macrophages. It's probably a mix of, of, mm -hmm. of, of signals. Um, but yeah, that's a very good question. Thanks. Okay, and I think Maria has her hand up. Go ahead, Maria. 
Thank you very much. Very nice talk, Matthias. Um, perhaps I've missed it, but um, what about the body weight in your exercise groups? Do they lose body weight or is it dependent on body weight changes? Hmm. Uh, if I remember correctly, they are a bit leaner. Yeah, they, they have slightly lower uh, 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 body weight. Um, but I, I think that, you know, uh, it's not necessary that, that, that they just have less, uh, that the whole body composition changes, right? They have less adipose tissue, but then probably more muscle mass. Mm -hmm. So um, I have to look it up and get back to you on, on what exactly we found in some supplementary panel, but we measured it, yeah. Ebru, yeah, go ahead. Uh, beautiful talk, Matthias. Um, I have a question. So have you um, combined this with like fasting and exercise or compared exercise to fasting? Yeah, uh, uh, great question. Um, so there, there, there are some recent uh, data, you know, there's one, one paper from Miriam um, saying that, that fasting can really uh, uh, typically decrease uh, uh, monocyte levels uh, acutely, right? And so we haven't tested that. Um, 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 so we haven't done any combination studies. It's very tempting to, we've also thought about, you know, combining stress and, and exercise to see, you know, how this cancels each other out. Um, it becomes very complex fast, um, especially if you look at different cell types and so forth. So I, I think while it's on the list, we haven't quite gotten there. But yes, yeah, so it's a, it's a uh, it's a it's a good point. It's, it's very interesting uh, because it's clear that uh, uh, exercise effects will be at least partially related by our metabolism. Sahi, yeah, go Maybe, ahead. Yeah, I mean, Matthias, you know, these are study easier done in human again uh, than in in animal models, and and today, especially with you know access to wearables and ways you could monitor somebody 24 hours. Uh, you can figure out their physical activity, you can figure out their sleep, you know, your heart rate variability. And, and now there is a, a pulse ox also a measurement. So there's a lot of physiological measurement that can be collected um, uh, 24 hours in people, uh, you know, in, in the context of a human study, so. Yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, the, even the, the study that you pointed out uh, in the there, physical activity was measured with an accelerometer. There was only accelerometer. Yeah. than just asking, you know, yeah. where people uh, habitually cheat on reporting how yeah. much they exercise. No, no, that's why, that's why Not I- Not you, you know, you, you tweet about it and I hope you don't make up stuff there when you do, but- <laughs> You never know. I mean, we, with social media, there's a lot of deceit, so. Yeah, so sometimes I see you're like at, you know, 90% level, you're going on for 10 hours. I'm like, Zai, how do you do this? <laughs> well, uh, Matthias, I'll invite you to my WHOOP uh, um, uh, member uh, team so you could see how bad I'm doing compared to the others. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, what are the effects of competition on our monocytes? That's another, that's another uh, good research question. Uh, that, that, that's a great group here to, to test it on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions for Matthias or anybody? No? Everybody's good. Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us again this Friday. We are six months into this pandemic. I think we said it's the 25th seminar. My goodness, and we will keep it going as long as everybody keeps attending. So thank you for that awesome seminar, Matthias. And remember to go and follow the trainees and get in touch with the trainees and um, they'll be holding seminars in conjunction with um, uh, these weekly things, maybe every two weeks or every month or something like that. So we'll make sure to uh, advertise broadly as well. So thank you everyone. Happy weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. Bye.